The topic today is inflammation, good for acute disease, bad for chronic disease. Um, we're always privileged to have a phenomenally um, outstanding panel that Dr. Fuster will introduce. We're also um, really privileged to have an outstanding visiting professor that Dr. Fuster will introduce in more detail, Dr. Peter Liu from uh, Ottawa, from Canada. Um, the topic is very complex. There was just a major uh, review in Jack with one of the longest blogs I've ever heard Dr. Fuster give. The blog was around 20 minutes long, going through it in tremendous detail. Um, but to put it all in perspective and to condense it so that we can all understand the panel discussion, Mike Gavalas, uh, he and uh, Luke Murphy were just uh, announced as our chief fellows for next year. Uh, Mike Gavalas has put together an excellent monograph on the subject. Uh, Dr. Gavalas. 18 minutes, 23 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Thank you for having me today. Inflammation is central to the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease from subclinical plaque formation to plaque rupture and acute MI. In vitro studies have identified activated macrophages, T cells, and certain interleukins such as IL-1 beta and IL-6 as being important in the development of plaque formation and progression. High sensitivity CRP is a well-established, highly sensitive marker of systemic inflammation and tissue damage and has been shown to strongly correlate with cardiovascular outcomes. Until recently, attempts to target these small molecules to reduce inflammation and improve cardiovascular outcomes have been largely unsuccessful. Non-invasive imaging with CT, MRI, and PET has rapidly progressed over the last decade. PET imaging is particularly attractive because it can be used to assess active arterial inflammation. A recent large-scale observational study using FDG PET MRI was able to detect arterial inflammation and plaques in asymptomatic individuals. This study found arterial inflammation in 48% of patients and 90% of patients had plaques. Of interest, coincident inflammation was present in only 11% of plaques, and most inflammation was detected in plaque-free arterial segments. This finding is intriguing and suggests that arterial inflammation and plaques represent different pathophysiological or temporal phenomena in atherosclerosis. Regarding therapeutics, statins reduce LDLC and are effective in indirectly reducing inflammation. The mechanism by which statins exert their anti-inflammatory properties are not fully understood. The most important trial to assess the benefits of statins and the inflammatory pathway was the 2008 Jupiter trial. This prospective primary prevention study targeted patients with normal LDL cholesterol, less than 130, and elevated low-grade inflammation with a CRP of more than two. The trial was stopped early at 1.9 years due to efficacy of the primary endpoint with a 44% relative risk reduction in the treatment group with rosuvastatin. Statin trials, although hypothesis generating, could not evaluate whether decreasing inflammation reduces vascular risk due to their concomitant potent LDL cholesterol reduction. The 2017 CANTOS trial was the first randomized control trial to show significant cardiovascular benefit with direct inhibition of the inflammatory pathway. The study drug, canakinumab, exerts its anti-inflammatory effect through IL-1 beta inhibition. Cantos included stable patients with previous MI and persistent inflammatory risk more than two, uh, CRP more than two, despite maximal medical therapy. At 48 months, canakinumab was effective in both reducing uh, high sensitivity CRP without changing lipid levels or blood pressure. The 150 milligram dose, but not the other doses, met the pre-specified endpoint which showed a 15% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. An important finding was the clinical benefits of canakinumab were greatest among those with the greatest biological response to therapy. Patients who had a high sensitivity CRP less than two, regardless of canakinumab dose, showed a 26% reduction in MACE and 31% reduction in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. The CERT trial published in February 2019 evaluate the effects of low-dose methotrexate on secondary prevention of cardiovascular events in patients with diabetes type 2 or the metabolic syndrome. However, unlike Cantos, CERT found no cardiovascular benefit 
from low-dose methotrexate in secondary prevention. While the results of CERT fail to demonstrate cardiovascular benefit, these results are perhaps unsurprising. Despite treatment with low-dose methotrexate, levels of IL-1 beta, IL-6, and high-sensitivity CRP were not reduced with low-dose methotrexate. Moreover, patients in CERT had lower baseline CRP as compared with CANTOS, which enrolled patients specifically with residual inflammatory risk. The results of CERT do not weaken the inflammatory hypothesis. Rather, it highlights the need to identify the correct inflammatory pathway to attenuate cardiovascular risk. Numerous trials are currently underway to evaluate alternative medications. Of special mention is the potential impact of colchicine, which showed promising, redose, promising initial results in the LODOCO trial. The Colchicine Cardiovascular Outcomes, or COLCOT trial, is a secondary prevention study that will complete in September 2019 with highly anticipated results to follow. Residual inflammatory risk remains a crucial aspect to atherosclerotic disease morbidity and mortality. After years of analysis, the inflammatory pathway and hypothesis has been validated in CANTOS. It also showed the greatest cardiovascular benefit was seen in patients who experienced the most significant re reduction in inflammatory risk. Much like the rise of statin therapy in the statin era after the 4S trial, 2017 may herald the anti-inflammatory era after the CANTOS trial. Ongoing research will hopefully identify additional pathways and therapeutics with clinical benefit in hopes of further reducing cardiovascular risk, morbidity, and mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Excellent uh, report about a very complex uh, endeavor, which is inflammation, and uh, congratulations for, uh, to you and Luke for being the chief residents. Residents, I don't mean it, I don't want to demean you. I mean uh, fellows. Um, it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, not only a great scientist, but a fantastic person, uh, Peter Liu. I will give you the background. I know him for many years. And I will say that um, he uh, obtained the MD degree at the University of Toronto. He had a clinical clerkship uh, after the MD degree uh, and also at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And finally, he decided to move on and be the intern and resident in cardiology and fellow. And um, uh, finally, the, he decided that he wanted to learn more. He took a while of a, as a research fellow in cardiac imaging, and then he had a postgraduate Master of Science program in epidemiology at McMaster's University. So he really had a fantastic background. In 1987, he became the director of the cardiovascular NMR at the University of uh, Toronto. Director of Cardiac Research, Cardiology Research, Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and then Professor of the Department of Physiology. Eventually, he became, in 2012, the Chief Scientific Officer of the University of Ottawa and Heart Institute, Professor of Medicine at Sachin University, and Professor of Cell and Molecular Medicine. Now, I will have to make the long story short. Uh, he has a very significant number of research awards but most recently, the Hypertension Canada Award of Excellence, the Margolis Prize in Cardiovascular Sciences, Robert Roberts Research Excellence Award, and the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, of, uh, Heart, of the Canadian Heart Failure Society. He has uh, numerous activities in, uh, professionally and otherwise, uh, in terms of, for example, in the editorial board, Canadian Journal of Cardiology, Circulation, JAC, Circulation Research, et cetera, et cetera, in two or three journals in heart failure. Now, in, uh, in terms of his uh, other academic activities uh, at the international level, I can mention so many. Among them, he's an HLBI biomarker heart failure panel, advisory panel on human health to to the director of NASA, et cetera, et cetera. And I cannot tell you how many commitments he has at the national level in Canada, and certainly at the university of level. 
It is quite striking that in terms of research grants between 2014 and 2019, he obtained six measure grants, international grants, most of the, from the Canadian government. And since 1985, he has been the, uh, the recipient of 18 grants. It's quite of an achievement. And he has played a measure role in committees uh, related to uh, clinical trials in 25 studies, different studies. So this being said, when you go to his bibliography, it's about 400 papers. And it's interesting, his background. I, I, I consider Dr. Liu as a physiologist that has slowly moved into basic investigation. And therefore, when you look at his CV, it's not surprising that he really has touched almost every field of cardiology at the physiological and uh, at the basic science level. Just to finish uh, today, it's very pertinent to mention that a good researcher has good patents. And the number of patents that he has uh, been in charge with successfully are 13. So I just want to say that we have an, with us today a real uh, excellent, outstanding individual in the field of cardiovascular diseases, and it's a pleasure to have him been here. I think it's for the first time, is this correct? Pleasure to see you and working with you for the next hour or so. Let me just give uh, Peter this uh, of a number. There's a lot of introductions here, but basically the Simon Duck Memorial Lecture and the Anandi Sharma Visiting Professor. And they say a lot of things good. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll give you this. Okay, so let's call the panel. And uh, is uh, okay. Here we are, uh, Dr. Kinney, uh, Gina La Roca, Jagat, Robert Rosenson, and obviously Michael. And you can you can sit here in the center, in the. Well, I, I enjoy preparing this uh, kind, I wouldn't call a debate, because the subject is so fascinating. And, and actually, it has evolved so rapidly in the last three years, but not because cantos. There's much more than the cantos study that really evolved recently. So in fact, I'm going to address, uh, believe it or not, these six subjects with 25 issues that I think are pertinent actually for discussion. And I would like to, the reason for presenting a slide has nothing to do to talk about uh, in a theoretical basis, but when we talk about inflammation, unless you see what we are talking about, it would become completely abstract. And this is the only reason why I would say as an exception, there are some slides being presented. Well, here is the first issue. Peter, do you think that inflammation is a defense mechanism? And the reason why I'm saying this is in the cardiovascular field, at least it seems to me, you have a myocardial infarction and the size of the infarct will depend on the inflammatory response at the very end. You have a patient with obesity in the peritoneum, you know, you have all these macrophages releasing all these substances for the, uh, you know, for the obesity syndrome, the metabolic syndrome. This is cholesterol is the same thing. Enters into the vessel wall, inflammation comes in. A hemorrhage in the brain. So when we focus, as it is the focus today, as Michael presented, 
in the atherosclerotic process, and this is my first question to you. Do you think that always inflammation is a response to some degree of foreign body? Yeah, you can go on. So um, I, yeah, so I think the inflammation is actually intrinsic uh, to our uh, ability to actually survive uh, in the environment. It's very interesting that uh, you actually see the evolution of a human, you know, sort of uh, in the evolution tree. And uh, so, you know, it's true the number of genes, for example, that we have compared to chimpanzee is not that different, uh, you know, in terms of numbers. But in terms of complexity, the a group of the genes that, that really has changed dramatically is actually inflammation. And they really allowed us to survive because of the fact that we have an inflammatory response to external antigens that we can actually uh, carefully uh, respond to and survive. So why, why people want to use vaccines to something that is of benefit? Well, actually, uh, I always want to actually mention that one of the things that we can actually do, you know, for cardiovascular disease is actually considering things like vaccines. And, uh, you know, there's a whole mechanism. We'll talk that. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, the, but uh, the aspect that is different now is that previously we were dealing with external uh, uh, you know, challenges, uh, external bugs, but now we're dealing with internal uh, uh, stress. You know, the cholesterol plaque is not actually going away. The myocardial infarction is staying there, and therefore is activating that system and no longer actually has the ability for you to actually, you know, sort of uh, correct it and make it at... Uh, you know, sort of back uh, to okay. uh, normal. And so this is sustained ability, you know, to challenge the immune system is where we actually get All to. All right, we'll see what happens by challenging. <laughs> okay, here's an issue, and here you have a panel of people, and Dr. Kinney and Dr. Narula. They, they are very interested in invasive technology to address inflammation, but when you are invasive, you are very focal. And my question is, we are dealing with a systemic disease. So I'd like to ask Dr. Narula, look, your name is here. This uh, all started in the 1970s by trying to image the atherosclerotic plaques for different methods, and I'm not going into the details. Then came the great issue, 1990 to 2005, we came into the vulnerable plaque, the high-risk plaque, a very focal phenomenon. But some of us, not all, move from here to here thinking that this would be a good research enterprise but would never help the patient in trying to identify a single plaque. And I can go into this non-invasive imaging. In fact, we're, we're, we publish, maybe this not the first time, the issue of inflammation. We have two articles in the New England Journal which we went from the plaque with erosion to the plaque rupture in this, all with inflammation. And we, are, we were very excited. And we call that high-risk plaque. You remember, Jagat? Rather than vulnerable plaque. And then the imaging came, and now we are able to see a lot, not only the arteries in, in a number of places, but also the reaction of the body, like the spleen and so forth. So Jagat, tell, what do you feel? My concept to you is that we need to do research at the focal level to understand mechanisms and maybe drugs, whether they can change a plaque or not. But on the other hand, I don't think you go much further than that. Is this correct? So, uh, Dr. Pustra, I fully agree uh, the way you have shown the evolution that we started looking at the plaques and then we went for the uh, focality by the non-invasive imaging and that we can do both by the, um, the CT uh, images or CT angiographic images, followed by the PET scans that we can do. And finally, the burden of the disease that you are so eloquently showing now by doing the MR imaging as well as the PET imaging of the whole body and focusing on the burden of the disease, which eventually would be the one which would be determining any event occurring at any level of the, uh, the uh, uh, vascular territory. So the, uh, what I would uh, respectfully submit here is that uh, there is uh, some role uh, left for the focality also, which also last time when I was giving a grand round, you were able to extract it so well at that time. Uh, 
that uh, the, uh, if a patient is on the table or if the patient has come with the stable angina and we have to take care of the, uh, the plaques which are likely to result in an event, we have to look at a few things. Number one, how significant is the lesion? That is what we have done anatomically. Uh, what is its FFR? So basically, once we go from the uh, old studies like the CAS or European CAS and all others, then we go to the FFR study, the FAME group of studies, we were able to get rid of at least 33% of cases which were still stenotic, but they did not have the physiologically important lesion. Now, if we go ahead and look at the recent data, which was again, uh, which came in the uh, JAK, very recently in uh, September last year, where the FAME2 data was in analyzed by doing the wall shear. And uh, they demonstrated that they were able to take another 33% away, uh, which are not likely to result in an event. And they actually found by looking at the FAME2 study that if you follow for five years, 50% of the people do not require any kind of, would not have required any kind of an intervention yeah. in those cases if you look at only the medically let me, treated let me, arm. Let me, uh, I agree with you. I think the only question, and I may ask you or Dr. Keeney, is the following. The number of plaques that you're going to see in a coronary arteriogram that are actually, you might call vulnerable, and how you're going to predict which one is wrong. I tend to agree with you, if you identify a culprit lesion, but this is not easy anyway, you already act. So I'm talking about more chronic disease, and this is the story from Davis, Augustini, and Chirubo, and that is that whenever you see patients that go to autopsy, the number of plaques, the patients that you see plaques that are vulnerable is very significant. But most importantly, of all the plaques that have rupture, only one leads to an acute syndrome. Right. So what I'm really saying is you're playing a gamble by trying to predict a plaque that is going to be troublesome. That's, that's, that's my point. So we are not trying to predict the plaque which is going to result in an event. Well, we are going to be trying to tell that these are the plaques which are not resulting in an event yeah. so that we would be able to at least save 50% of plaques on one hand. Yeah. Rest of the plaques, we want that they should not progress further or regress. And the second important thing is looking at the burden of the disease and make the disease quiescent as you have demonstrated. So the role will be not picking the plaques up, role will be excluding the plaques which are not likely to result in an event. So would we be able to at least get rid of an intervention in 50% yeah. of cases? Okay, uh, Dr. Kinney, you have been very involved with this. Uh, I can only want to say to you that today in the world, the number of patients that in the world cardiac catheterization at one time time or another is one in 200. This is global health, very well known. So when we are talking about what Dr. Narula is saying, which I don't disagree with, remember what is the impact that we are having in the world by just going in basically on the number of people that in fact is minimum in which we had the chance to look at? That's my question to you. Uh, I think as discussed, one is that if you see a chronic patient and you have an obstructive disease, you will go with physiology by doing FFR. If you are taking, again, chronic uh, stable or unstable patient, and uh, I mean, as Dr. Narula mentioned, there is a way that you can exclude. But your question is, how do we figure out which plaque is the yeah. high risk or unstable plaque? Can we do any kind of imaging modality in the lab to figure that out? Uh, there is IVUS modality, which the prospect uh, has shown that you can do IVUS and see based on uh, you know whether there is a tikva or the plaque burden. Or more important, we can do the opti uh, optical clearance or tomography and show which are the plaques that uh, actually have a thin cap likely uh, to be unstable or uh, high risk. Well, if I that's think, your question, I yes. think we are dealing about two different issues, and we are all a little bit in agreement with the others. Uh, I think my issue, maybe more passionate, is that I feel what can we do for the world in general, and therefore it's much better external imaging overall, we'll present the data in a minute, than just going in the way you say, but I don't disagree at all. Roxana, are you, why you don't sit here too? No, come on, get a chair and sit. Yeah, yeah. Is a chair there? Come in, 
So you follow? I think we are all in agreement. Is 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 the way you see the world? It can be seen from two different ways. Well, let's now go into something is very exciting actually, and and we were involved. This was published this week, and that is the natural history by systemic imaging with external uh, 3D ultrasound with PET and with MRI in 800 people. We are doing this in actually in 4,000 people that are between age 25 and age 55. So this is middle age when we want to know who is developing the disease and who is not. Well, first of all, Peter, what do you think? Let me tell you what we find about focal disease in people at this age, which were 4,000 people. There are two thirds have already two, three, four, five, or six segments with disease. Let me tell you what we did. We did 3D ultrasound of the carotids, of the main aorta, two iliofemorals, and calcification of the coronaries. So six regions. And this is what we see in males, close to age 50, and this is in females, it's half. The only thing with females, it advances more rapidly afterwards. Are you surprised? This is, this is a huge amount of a problem. This is silent disease. Yeah, so, and I think this is a compatible with some of the earlier studies, you know, pathology studies, you know, for example, from the uh, uh, Vietnam uh, war veterans, uh, you know, even uh, younger po population. And it really actually suggests that uh, given the environment that we're in, uh, that we have uh, the kind of uh, uh, the systemic uh, susceptibility, you know, to actually develop this. But the big difference here is that uh, uh, what is the threshold you know, at which uh, these lesions uh, become, you know, sort of uh, disease causing, right? You know, so in fact, all of us, uh, believe it or not, you know, do actually harbor these lesions. And these lesions actually will come and go. They are very dynamic. And uh, so the question is, you know, how do we eventually come to ability to alter our environment, uh, internal environment, to deal, you know, with the external environment? You know, so obviously the solution to this is to you know, reduce the inciting factors in the external environment, but what is the strategy we should have for but let, it, let me tell you the bad news, okay? okay. The, bad yeah. news, the bad news, which is going to be published, we have a follow-up for three years in the 4,000 people. And believe it or not, and this is all blindly done by the, by the people who look at the images, 41% there is already progression in three years of follow-up of a significant burden of disease. Uh, so, um, Robert, what do you think? Surprising? It's, uh, I, I think Certainly, it's a, a lot of burden of disease. I'm, um, you know, um, there are many different risk factors, many different diets, environmental exposures that uh, are causing chronic inflammation. And so the question is, how much could be explained by these risk factors? How much is... Uh, needs to uh, be investigated with uh, you know, some emerging risk factors, under understanding certain of uh, inflammatory pathways. But we know that uh, there's certain uh, you know, innate immune responses that yeah. people have certain cell types that make them more predisposed to a pro-inflammatory response. Um, and um, you know, that's uh, something that may be uh, an opportunity with this, uh, this work. Well, we have the data okay. with, with MRI and PET. Actually, we did the first of the 4,000, and again, was published this week. Of the 4,000, we did near 1,000. And let me explain to you what we did. Basically, we did MRI of the whole carotid system, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, iliofemoral region. And we did PET and MR. MR more for fibrotic lesions, Gina and PET more for inflammatory lesions. So we are now getting into real business. And actually, it's fascinating. Basically, this is not surprising. The disease begins in the iliofemoral region. 73% of the people had positive MR or um, PET in that region. The thing is, the arteries are so large that we don't know we have the disease. This is the carotids, and this is all MRI. But look here, this is PET. And actually, our hypothesis, which has to be proven in longer follow-up, this is the beginning of the disease and the, with PET. And this is the progression that the lesions become fibrotic. And later on, I believe the fat gets in and you have the vulnerable plaques. 
And this is actually what is evolving from this study. And going back to you, Robert, we now have the data on what you said, the risk factors and everything. Look, if you have, for example, first the age of the people. The age of the people says, with MRI, older you are, the iliofemoral, more than the others, progresses. And so, PET. But look here. Here you have the number of risk factors, the important role that the risk factors play on the inflammatory lesions and on the fibrotic lesions. And I think this in itself, I think is uh, what is really telling us is we have a problem. And the problem is so subclinical and we don't pay attention to. That is amazing by this imaging technologies how much you can learn. So Peter? Yeah, so this is uh, fantastic data, I just love it. And uh, so it really actually brings home on the fact that uh, uh, our current, uh, you know, sort of existence, you know, in the modern environment is actually a potentially pro-inflammatory uh, uh, environment. But I would actually say that this is actually great data to have because I, uh, uh, and of course we can, uh, we'll talk about, you know, I, I hope we can talk about vaccine because there are actually really interesting uh, strategies to modify this. Uh, it really now comes down to the ability for us to say this is happening and in order to change the natural history, the thing is that we're not locked into this. Hmm. You know, so the ability to recognize this is super important because of the thing is that uh, uh, we know that even with exercise, you actually change uh, your potential, you know, macrophage uh, phenotypes. And uh, keeping in mind that the macrophage is all dynamic. And then the other aspect is also, which we don't talk about, uh, uh, but I, it's my favorite, is the T regulatory cells, you know, which actually changes. We'll talk yeah. about this in a moment. Okay, great, perfect. Sure. And uh, so these are actually dynamic balance in which we potentially can actually sure. have some control over. So this is the opportunity, you know, given this type of data to change the natural history. And the, we're not locked sure. in there. No, first, it's a very elegant way of showing the data that the way the progression has occurred over the three years and it would be so interesting to see what exactly happens when we follow these people who are the progressors versus who are the non-progressors and what would be the event rate in them. Because what we did was in the CT, and again, that was the Jack paper, 2015, 3,000 people followed for 10 years' time, of which 500 people were those where the CT angiograms were done at an interval of one year in 500 patients. And we looked at the plaques, the plaques in which the high-risk plaques progressed over the next one year, there was 35-fold higher likelihood of having an event, yeah. while those high-risk plaques, which did not progress over the next one year, they had zero event rate over the next 10 years. Yeah. So it's essentially going in the same direction, yeah. what you are suggesting, and it will be so interesting to see how these people behave when you follow them up over yeah. a period of time. Thank you. Well, um, Roxana and Robert, now comes the issue that is being discussed. Can we correct this? And I want to go away with the concept of the residual risk, which I think is fascinating concept. And before I go any further, Gina, do you have any comments about the MRI uh, for the arterial? You didn't mention, I didn't ask you. Um, as far as cardiac MRI with inflammation, it's more myocardial than it is on a cellular level. It's um, inflammation of the myocardium, so you're looking at edema um, with parametric um, T1 and T2 mapping. You're looking at hyperemia, um, either T1 or T2 weighted and looking at late gadolinium enhancement or early gadolinium enhancement, looking at scar tissue. We're also even pushing the envelope, looking at myocardial strain. Um, and so those, those are things um, grossly on a myocardial level. But what Dr. Liu and I were just discussing was, um, going back to your um, previous um, question, was that the immunomodulators, where have we gone with cardiovascular disease? And it's not from lack of trying. Um, the paper from uh, April 9th really gives a really exhaustive review. It's a beautiful review of uh, inflammation and cardiovascular disease. And this one particular area that we were discussing earlier um, for cardiovascular disease and the vulnerable prolac is the immunomodulator targeted at PLA2. And they actually showed 1,200 patients that were on this immunomodulator that changed from a vulnerable plaque to a fibrotic plaque, a stable plaque. Yeah. 
And so it's I think, fascinating. I think and the, it's more CT-based than it is MRI-based. I think we have more to line. say in a moment about the parametric approach. And you, you have been working on myocarditis and the jump of MRI in the last three years by using the parametric approach is amazing. You can see the injury, the edema, you can see the extracellular fat and so forth. But let's continue on the, on the arteries. And now comes into Robert and Roxana. And I, I, I like to go over this because I think it's, far, it's fascinating and important. Okay, first of all, uh, you, you remember the Jupiter trial. In the Jupiter trial, these were patients with a high CRP. And actually, I think the LDL was about 130. It was, was a little bit high. And then what they did is uh, when both went down were the best results. When only was the LDL, the results were not so good. But this is not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the three studies in which the best therapy was given. They prove it, they improve it, and they inspire one, inspire two. Here, what we have is high-intensity statins to the point that the LDL reached 70 or less. HRP was still high, a little high, despite of the best approach. This, practically the same, except in this case, the LDL was a little bit higher, the CRP was a little bit lower. But certainly, this is the best you can do. I think the question is, Roxana, is we have a problem here. Still, despite of everything we do, here there is an important inflammatory component, which is actually in blue, and that is when everything has been done, still CRP is significantly high in the three studies, about one-third. So you agree, and I will ask you, Robert, in a moment too, that there is a lot to be done here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, this study, and we've also, myself, Dr. Kinney, and Dr. Sharma, have also explored this further in our PCI patient population, where we found very similar approach. In fact, we found that our patients who had a PCI and their, we, as you know, we measure um, serial H, uh, C-reactive protein in all of our patients who come to the cath lab. So we have over 10,000 patients with data exactly like this, that despite best therapies, if you can't get the LDL, even if you achieve the LDL under 70, with the C-reactive protein elevated beyond two, and staying elevated, continues to stay elevated, this is a huge marker of mortality after PCI, well, despite everything that you can possibly do. So inflammation and that residual risk, despite the best possible therapies, do have an important implication even in our patients with PCI. So we have very similar yeah. data, Dr. Christian. Well, Michael, before I ask Robert, I think this is fascinating. This to me is the most important, in my view, one of the most important findings recently. And that is when we talk about residual inflammation, we just talk about it. You just mentioned this, Roxana. But look what happened. We have residual cholesterol risk, despite of the best therapy, residual thrombotic risk, residual triglyceride risk, and residual LP little a risk. That's the reality. My question is, there's so much to be done. And this is why we have still so many events, because we, try, we treat one thing, but we don't treat the five things. And Michael, I'd just like to ask you how you react. Look, here, in this part, in fact, what you have is a high LDL cholesterol, and here you have the new drugs, the, uh, the, uh, K, the uh, PCSK9 uh, inhibitors. It's amazing to me. This is what is happening. But look what is happening here. The, the combination of the NOAX now with aspirin is happening. Triglycerides, I still, we still have the data is evolving, but it's not the triglycerides by themselves. And they'll be little a probably antisense therapy. Is that right, Robert? Yes. In the next two years or so, maybe. What I'm going to present this slide is to point out that although we are talking about inflammation today, we have a huge disease that by imaging is galloping. We don't pay too much attention to. But there's a lot of residual that we have to approach from a very systemic point of view at all levels. This is basically my concern. So uh, comments, Michael or Robert? Well, I think it, uh, the slide points out that it's not just uh, fixing one risk factor. Uh, the SPIRE trial 
uh, looks at patients that have LDLs below 30, and despite that, they still have residual cardiovascular risk. When you stratify according to high sensitivity CRP, that might be a little bit more predictive of their outcomes from the cardiovascular standpoint. So to think that controlling one risk factor to an extreme sense might prevent, you have to take it all into consideration and reduce all risk factors, and then identify them as substrates to the bigger problem, which is inflammation, which is kind of the catalyst that's driving all of this. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I think it's um, an issue with identifying, uh, you know, a major risk factor and looking at some of the downstream processes that may overlap some of these other areas. For example, we know that uh, much of the risk with lipoprotein A is due to the oxidative modification of the uh, Kringle 410 uh, uh, repeat. So reducing LPA may reduce inflammation. It also, we know that uh, the APOA uh, has homology with plasminogen, may influence thrombosis. And taking a more integrative approach, I think, is uh, the way that we need to proceed to you know, optimize uh, you know, resources and help uh, you know, with uh, you know, patients. I think that this uh, silo approach is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's simplistic, but not necessarily you know, so accurate. Uh, because there is overlap uh, in some of these, uh, you know, pathways. We will address in a moment all the different modif modifiers. Uh, Peter, how do you react to all of these and to the residual risk problem? Yeah, so I think this uh, comes back to some of the concept we also talk about at the noontime, right? You know, we're dealing yeah. with multifactorial diseases. And uh, it's now we're coming to the stage where we can unpack a number of the journey pathways that actually leads to the final common, you know, sort of a complication of uh, a rupture plaque. And so we now need to turn the clock back in a way in which we really begin to say, you know, what pathways are active and how do we address, you know, each of the pathways. And so that only a single factor ultimately still, you know, leaves you exposed. And so it's really figuring out, you know, for a given individual patient, how many uh, you know, sort of uh, risk are truly biological risk, you know, so it's not just the clinical risk now, a uh, biological risk, and how do we actually most effectively address it? You know, is this through a common single answer, or is actually the most, you know, parsimonious combination that will actually bring down all those contributing biological pathways? Uh, can I make sure, a comment? Sure, go ahead. So the question here is that what is the residual risk? Where do we set the bar? Is it inflammation? It is super added inflammation. It is out of proportion inflammation. Where exactly are we setting the bar? So Jupiter was 130, and we know that 130 is not normal. It is way above normal. Okay. We talk about the next trial where we come to Cantos, and we are talking of 70. Should my bar be 70, or should my bar be 30, coming quite like Odyssey and Fourier and uh, other things. If at 25 of LDL, which is what we are born with, if at that there is still an inflammatory component, I will call it a residual risk or I will call it something which is out of proportion, yeah. inflammation. So I think all these studies which have done, they have set the bar too high for us to even believe that we require anything else. Then when we go to the DAP studies or the COMPASS study and all, I think the entire benefit is coming either from the carotid, uh, the stroke uh, reduction, or coming from the peripheral artery disease reduction. Yeah. And with you, that I had the opportunity to recently do that editorial on it, that can we now really talk about a different phenomenon of atherothrombotic versus atheroembolic disease, that the plaques which are eventually leading to the peripheral disease or to strokes, yeah. they require way more reduction in their LDL component as compared to coronaries because Compass did not touch the coronaries. Yeah, well, I think, I think what is fascinating is that we are now learning that the field is very complex and we are just scratching the surface. And this leads to the next slide, and that is, you all know the effect of cholesterol lowering, and you know more reduction in LDL cholesterol, lower is the relative risk reduction. What I think is fascinating is now we are going to enter into the complexity of this, and that is, with a completely normal LDL of less than 75, here comes this Cantus study in which they are just touching to an aspect of inflammation, and by itself, 
there is a different now. You have a residual risk that has nothing to do with cholesterol. Um, Anu, do you have any comments about it? I know you have been trying to modify a lot your findings with the yellow plaque and so forth, but there are so many possibilities, it seems to me. I'd like you to comment about it. I think we have to move, not, we cannot leave cholesterol LDL, but we have to move further, and this is actually what is going to be the next section that we are going to address. Very interesting here is the same, the, which I think uh, Roxana just mentioned was a residual uh, you know, inflammatory risk which, has, which remains in patient. The question comes is that is there that this group of patients, are we able to identify who these patients are? Of course, what Cant uh, Cantos has shown that uh, yes, these patients, I think number one treatment for majority of these patients are statin. Statin does uh, take care of majority of the inflammation, and we all know that it has um, the uh, property of uh, statin. Is there something else that we need to treat this patient uh, be beyond um, to treat the residual inflammation? There is some drug that we need to find. Which drug that is probably the one that was, uh, you know, uh, Kenny map, which was uh, used. What we found. Uh, bo both in yellow trial as well as, uh, you know, we found some, a few genes that um, were very important in these patients. Uh, these are the genes which were uh, for cholesterol metabolism, inflammation, um, uh, as well as uh, vascular, uh, um, you know, inflammation. All of them were the genes that were, uh, you know, um, perturbed in these uh, patients. Some of them are da down regulated or some, were, or some of them were. Uh, uh, upregulated. I uh, on the sub study of this patient that we just mentioned, the residual uh, risk who had. Why is it that these guys, despite treatment with statin, what is it different in this uh, group of patients? Is they have a special plaque, which is that they have a uh, more lipid as well as a uh, thin cap in this uh, group of patients. Okay, so. Let's now uh, go into the situation of the inflammation because it's complex. And I will only tell you, not to become scared, but 25 treatments for inflammation have been done in trials already, and we have to go over to realize that the inflammatory pathway is so complex that Cantos was very lucky to find interleukin one better playing a major role. Having said that, let me begin by saying that what appears to be fascinating is that whatever the inflammation goes after, in this case, is cholesterol deposition in the vessel wall. The macrophages are type two that are profibrotic, and this is a way of healing. But there is these macrophages type one, which actually are also benefit because clear the area where there is a lot of debris, but they may actually break further the plaque in making things worse. This is critically important for the following reason. We are actually are collaborating both groups now with the Boston and us, and I will tell you the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is the following, that when there is trouble, the monocytes that circulate here, they recognize the trouble and they release interleukin one beta. And the interleukin one beta goes to the bone marrow and actually goes to the spleen, and actually the predominant monocytes that come out are the macrophages type one, which are the cleaners, and they make things worse. So what basically one does with kanakinumab is just blocks this. So it's a way of inflammation which is very, very focused on a particular macrophage. Well, having said this, I like to go into what I think is fascinating, which is to really get into the whole inflammatory and immune system which is not only important in disease we're talking about, but in many diseases. And here you have a number of uh, processes. In red, uh, you will see in a moment what it means, and in green, you will see in a moment what it means. But let's go into the details. And Peter, uh, we need your help here. There is uh, obviously the concept is that whenever risk factors are present or high LDL, somehow LDL gets into the vessel wall. And behind the LDL, which is oxidized, and you have a recruitment 
particularly of monocytes. That's basically the issue. And then the monocytes become very activated, and what they do is they take the excess of oxidized LDL, and this is the process of defense. I mean, I'm talking rubber in a very simple way, but just to point out what has been done thus far in trying to attack this process, which is, is, is quite interesting. The, the question that I'd like to, um, to address, and maybe, maybe is going step by step, is first, in green, are actually uh, drugs that are being given for other reasons, but that can have an anti-inflammatory properties. And I'd like to ask Robert, the number one, two, and three that we will mention, the first is statins, appear to have some blockade on this process from the macrophage into the foam cells. And what is in the recent uh, review that actually came out in Jack just uh, very recently appears to interfere with interferon gamma that is released from the macrophages. And I know you have worked, Peter, on this. Robert, do you have any comment? Could the statins actually be effective as anti inflammatories at this level? And then, Peter, I will ask you the same question. So it's been uh, shown many years ago that statins uh, decrease uh, nuclear factor kappa B uh, activation. Um, you know, this is a, a very important, uh, you know, uh, a regulator that uh, initiates pro-inflammatory cytokine production. We've shown uh, in uh, whole blood uh, stimulation samples that statins decrease cytokine production. It's been shown in cell culture that it decreases cytokine production. And so it's clearly uh, an important uh, you know, pathway and also related to CRP. There are uh, imaging studies, which you've already discussed, uh, which you've uh, pioneered uh, here, uh, that have shown that uh, stands promptly reduce uh, inflammation in the arteries and that by uh, imaging, and that supports some of the carotid and arterectomy uh, uh, studies, CRISBY circulation, and uh, also studies on coronary uh, atherectomy decrease in inflammatory cell burden. So statins do have an important inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect. But with that being said, you know, one would consider them um, you know, modestly effective uh, because uh, many people still have events on uh, statins. And so we need to uh, then uh, you know, look at uh, what is the response to statin, what inflammatory pathways are you know, active in a particular individual, and how is that influenced by some of their other comorbid conditions such as, let's say, uh, HIV, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. Okay, let's start, Peter, uh, uh, following what Robert is saying, uh, now there is the new data, and whether you agree or disagree, very similar to statins, PCSK9 inhibitors are doing the same thing. Is this correct? Yes, I think. This so, is fascinating. Is this a step here? Yeah, so, um, uh, so I think the uh, interesting thing about the immune system is that uh, it's not uh, pure black and white. You know, I always say that it's a bit of like an yin yang uh, type of a situation. And uh, that uh, it's really uh, um, uh, uh, altering the balance, you know, of the pro inflammatory versus the anti inflammatory that give you uh, the net benefit. And then the other thing which uh, we uh, sometimes forget that uh, the inflammatory process is a systemic process. And that, uh, you know, uh, I always regard uh, these uh, cells as a little uh, almost uh, um, sentinel soldiers. And they constantly monitor our environment, you know, including the plaque. And then they constantly send out signals to their bodies. A lot of them are in the bone marrow, a lot of them in the spleen. And they are the ones that can actually call in and to cause trouble. So statins actually has the effect locally and it can, you know, modify, uh, in fact, some of the immune signaling like LP60, LCK, and all the others. So it actually modifies some of the amplification pathways. So that is you know, where statins can be helpful. But this type of uh, effect is more or less in the presence of an inciting factor like yeah. lipids. Yeah. You know, because by themselves, they're not actually. Well, uh, it's interesting. First, a question to you. Yeah. Why is it that the PCSK9 does not decrease the CRP <laughs> systemic level? It as does. Compared to it, these it does. It does. Absolutely. It, it was told was not the data Sorry. evolving. It does it too. It's not correct, Peter. The ones in the yeah. VA. I don't know. They, let the experts say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, 
you know, CRP is, uh, you know, hepatic systemic inflammatory mediator, and there's experimental uh, studies uh, that have shown that uh, PCSK9 inhibitors reduce uh, inflammatory cells. Uh, you know, they uh, work in the low sh shear stress areas where PCSK9 gets upregulated. Silencing actually decreases inflammation. We have the data from Bernalo published in the uh, European Heart Journal looking at mononuclear cells that decrease cytokine production. Be, be sure, because production. we have so much to talk okay. still. And so we're, we're actually looking at uh, uh, mononuclear cells in an ongoing IS trial to look at uh, inflammatory pathways, seven different toll receptors, and looking at the detailed pathways of PCSK9. There's more to the story than just what happens at the level of CRP. Yeah, and we'll talk about CRP in a moment, answering your question. CRP is really a passive phenomenon. It's not an active one. But let's, uh, Peter, any more comments? I want to ask you, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are also in he coming here. And they say many times we don't know how they decrease cardiovascular events, and they are also appear to work in this pathway here. Are you, uh, is, are you in agreement with that? Yes, absolutely. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, angiotensin itself is actually you know, pro-oxidant, but also pro-inflammatory. And in fact, when we use ACE inhibitors, uh, we already take advantage. And if you actually look at the winners, you know, when you compare statin, say, azetamide, or, you know, many of the other ways in which you lower cholesterol before, you know, statin always had that edge, uh, simply because it was able to actually address It's fascinating because all the drugs, and let me go into beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers is actually number five. Beta blockers, I say, they actually work on preventing the chemiotaxis of the monocytes as begin are preventing to enter too many into the vessel wall. This is also evolving at the present time. And actually, aspirin at a very low dose makes the release of uh, nitric oxide. So what we are really talking about is that all the drugs that we are giving, many of them, we don't have the mechanisms. They are now beginning to evolve from the inflammatory pathways. So this is basically what one reads. Uh, any other comments, Peter? Yeah, so uh, I think down the road, what uh, we can do and uh, the opportunity is uh, to have a better um, a biomarker readout uh, because, uh, you know, we know the genetics, and, uh, but uh, we uh, don't really actually have a good handle apart from imaging in terms of what is the net balance of the inflammatory response for that individual. You know, we know that we, you know, let's say we'll have a bug go around, you know, some individuals you know, never even have a sneeze, and other people, you know, are sick, you know, and couldn't work, right? It's really actually our differential immune response that's inherent within us. And, uh, you know, if you actually look at susceptibility to a lot of infections, it all comes down to the interferon response genes. Yeah. And that's inherent, you know, in us, that's different. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think this is the question, is that which one of us are going to react really adverse to to these pathways, and how can we... I think, Roxana, what does, it appears important to us is that although we talk about inflammation very loose and we are completely obsessed about the Cantor's study, the reality is that many of the drugs that we are using today probably now are beginning to show that they have a different approach and the pathways are within the, within the inflammatory process. And yeah. this leads to, uh, at least to ask you, and then Robert again, this in green looks good news. In red is fascinating. What the industry has done in the last uh, seven or eight years is trying to block specific molecules that actually activate this process. And I just want to comment in general, Robert, you, I'm sure you have m a lot of knowledge. There is an antibody which actually blocks this particular receptor here. This is another that blocks the surface of the macrophage before it's activated. These are the names. Dara, do you know this? Darapadi it was a big, big issue years ago. And basically what it does is, is really also the, the movement of this process into this process at a different level. It was a complete failure. These are two particular molecules that appear to be very important in the process of progression of the inflammation, complete failure and so forth. So what I'm really asking you, uh, uh, Robert, is it seems to me that there are a number of drugs that are not anti-inflammatory drugs that appear to begin to show that they have an important role in inflammation and what has come from industry, just blocking specific molecules are beginning to be a failure or really a failure. Yes, um, I think um, what you're highlighting is the complexity of the inflammatory response and then the uh, 
interaction between inflammation and other processes. So I led the Varus Platib uh, international uh, trials, the secretory PLA2, phospholipase A2 inhibitor, and uh, we had uh, good biomarker uh, data we published in The Lancet, but uh, and uh, favorable effects on CRP, the Francis ACS trial, but when the VISTA-16 trial was done, the outcome study, there were actually more myocardial infarctions, and it appeared that that drug increased uh, thrombus formation in people that had a prior uh, MI. So that's where things become um, very complicated. Many of these biomarkers have been uh, developed from uh, prospective observational studies. At the time that they were developed, we didn't have uh, the type of uh, sophisticated GWAS Mendelian randomization studies to support you know, their uh, involvement uh, in, a, as in the causal pathway. And I think that we you know, went down the wrong uh, you know, uh, pathway and they failed. But it's, this is a very complicated uh, process. You talked about the uh, you know, vaccine to oxidized LDL or you know, target for oxidized LDL. It's one of many stimuli that activates nuclear factor kappa B, but it's not the only one. And so it's really trying to identify the individuals where that pathway is most operative and then studying those individuals. And that's probably why Cantos works so well is because you know, Paul Ritker selected people with high CRP where interleukin-1-beta is in the, you know, the pathway for CRP. When you, uh, you know, include an a anti-inflammatory drug like methotrexate without the data that shows that it uh, has anti-inflammatory effects in the vascular cells, you may end up with uh, failure like they did in uh, CERT. Peter? Peter? These are all the new trials going yeah, on. Absolutely. Are actually seven. Uh, so and, in and I just want to say that this is why the lucky that we have kanakinumab because basically is, is, an, is the interleukin that is released when there is trouble, as I mentioned before, and just independently of everything. And then these interleukins have a number of pathways and now you know, are being approached by all these methods. Um, I just want to say that the other part of the story is that this vessel wall to react needs lymphocytes. And there are also pathways that are being addressed by these different drugs. I don't want to go into the detail, but just to point out that this is a very lucky, very, very lucky finding, the Cantos study. And we should not rely on Cantos in saying this is the whole issue of inflammation. It's just, it came out and this is the reality. Uh, Dr. Narula, what is your comment? Uh, I, I fully agree with you, Dr. Booster. In 2007, I had published a rabbit uh, data where uh, we produced the atherosclerosis gave them caspase 1 inhibitor, caspase 3 inhibitor, caspase 8 inhibitors, 9 inhibitors, and a pan-caspase inhibitor. Pan-caspase inhibitor was the best in reducing the uh, inflammation as well as the lipid-rich plaques. And uh, number two was caspase 1 and caspase 8. So essentially going through the same pathway, working through the, the uh, interleukin 1. And essentially, I mean, Paul Ritker has uh, mentioned that paper repeatedly. Somehow or the other, that is the inflammasome area where exactly the uh, work is happening. But I have to tell one very important thing here, and that is, Dr. Fuster, I mean, uh, it is going a little off the subject, but an editor has a big role in modulating a field where the cardiology is going for that matter or anything else is going. I, I tell you, the more I look at Jack, the more I realize that the way you have captured this field of atherosclerosis in Jack, I don't think there is any journal on the planet which really deals with this subject so well. And the quality of the articles in, in Jack are, are beyond imagination. So I, I must compliment, and I think the, the audience I should audience call my wife to me. come here, just, 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 just to listen, because she says I work too much. So. No, I mean, Thank there's you. no I doubt appreciate, about it. I appreciate it. it. It's very much, but actually, let me, let me move into the next field, which to me is the most fascinating one, and it's from the heart to the head. Let me tell you something. What is happening is absolutely incredible at the present time, and um, just to make a long story short, we started the study based on the fact, and Dr. Narula knows about it, that we, we look at all these six segments with technology, but some of the patients, as you know, were injected with gadolinium. 
and we look at the brain, and what we begin to see is a relationship between what was in the large arteries and these tiny lacuna lesions in the brain, which I think, well, they're not here, in which basically is the blockage of an arteriola leading to a microinfarct and cognitive dysfunction. Since that time, there are at least 12 studies showing the same thing. We enter in our study 300 patients already between Madrid and here in New York, and we are beginning to see this correlation. And that is, whatever the risk factors cause in the large arterial system, this actually happens in the tiny arteries of the brain. But it's not atherosclerotic disease. It's actually intimal medial thickening, closing the arteriola. But, and this is just to point out that this is what we are worried about. We are worried about uh, stroke in red according to age. This is cognitive dysfunction related to the process that I'm describing. This is coming in the literature. But the most fascinating data Actually, um, I don't want to go into more detail. The most fascinating data is the one I'm going to present to you because I think it's, interesting. it's the first time I present this and we obtained the data two weeks ago. And that is what happened with PET in the brain, in the cells of the brain, and with other technologies with the risk factors. And what we use, uh, you know this parametric mapping analysis, Gina, and it's very fascinating. Here you have individuals with significant risk factors. And here, by the parametric approach, these are areas that are hypometabolically active. In other words, decrease. And we have the areas identified. And this is actually with the several risk factors. This is actually uh, done with uh, patients with diabetes. This is done with the smokers. This is hypometabolism, which we can, by the computer, make it <coughs> yellow. And this is actually C-reactive protein when it is elevated. And now here is the hypothesis. We believe that the vasculature that is affected by the risk factors is affecting the metabolism of the neurons. And this is what leads to cognitive dysfunction and to other issues. This is completely new. And this was done already in, uh, in 250 out of the 800 patients that I presented before in the previous study of progression of the disease. What I'm really saying is, and, and I took advantage to present this to you because we are so excited, and that is there's a huge interaction between the risk factors that we play and we discuss today and the brain. And whether it's inflammation or something else, I think we are really better as cardiologists to start focusing our attention into the brain because the same thing is happening, but there is a problem. The quality of life is being affected by, uh, by cognitive dysfunction. Peter? This is amazing data. And uh, so uh, this uh, fits with some of the, certainly the epidemiology data to actually show that uh, you know, cognitive impairment is uh, you know, mostly driven by cardiovascular risk factors and the things like exercise and uh, you know, sort of addressing those factors are still one of the best ways, you know, despite people looking for tau, you know, protein and, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, the amyloid uh, plaque, and which are all uh, failed. And uh, then the other aspect is that uh, we um, also, you know, follow, you know, a lot of the discussions that you actually have initiated, you're looking at the PET, uh, you know, flow reserve, which is measuring the microvasculature, you know, and uh, they are the, actually the biggest drivers for, uh, you know, cognitive impairment. And uh, so there is a tremendous um, crosstalk between the cardiovascular system and the brain, which we actually don't uh, necessarily uh, always uh, think about because of you know, the way we yeah. segment uh, our care. But uh, I would think that uh, this really shows the public health impact you know, sort of, uh, of uh, putting this type of uh, mechanism in place to actually understand this. And we sometimes forget that uh, the uh, microvasculature which is way more uh, sensitive to actually inflammatory, uh, uh, you know, sort of changes because it's much smaller, and uh, that uh, the um, uh, the uh, the vascular function is uh, a lot of times driven by actually how much inflammatory potential. You know, we saw also the vascular, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, inflammation activities is in the vessels, and uh, that actually has way more 
uh, you know, impact. And uh, I would venture that even some of the HEF-PEF we see, you know, in patients with, uh, uh, you know, diabetes and uh, hmm. uh, uh, those conditions also carry some of these mechanisms, you know, in which the microvasculature hmm is actually leading to some of the metabolic... Uh, uh, Gina, what do you think, thank you. Yeah. Gina, what do you think about all these technologies now? Because they're amazing what you can learn. In I'm this always, case, it's PET, what we yeah. did. I'm always fascinated by PET, PET MR, particularly not so much PET CT, but um, PET MR. And I was wondering, my question to you is, do you have PET, uh, cardiac PET MR on these patients? Because it would like, it'd be interesting to see on, on, a, on a myocardial level what the uh, metabolic activity is of these patients as well, um, in addition to you know brain pet. What happened is we have done this independently. We have you know we have not done the PET MR at the same time in this group of patients. We started with PEN because there is a cog there is a concept in the in the recent literature that the vascularity the vascular problem may lead to metabolic problem, and that's where the cognitive dysfunction comes from, and this is why we use PET because we thought it's the best technique to, to, to address this. Yeah, Roxana? I'm, I'm fascinated by what these data, the implications of these data are tremendously important. And I'm hoping that Transep continues this, this effort and that we, uh, I mean, our understanding of why is it that uh, there is cognitive demise in our patients with cardiovascular disease may be far beyond micro uh, infarcts, and you're describing something that hasn't been done before. So I think it's really incredibly important. Congratulations, Dr. Fuster. Michael, what did you learn uh, by reviewing all the literature about the subject of inflammation? Give us a capsule report of uh, what did you learn? I think it's complicated. <laughs> and. Um... I think that a lot of what we do is using maybe blunt tools to try to uh, attenuate a more complex process. If we could prevent the aging process, that would be ideal. But uh, all the things you're talking about, exercise, lowering diabetes risk, inflammation, are primary prevention things that we're trying to block a little bit too late in the process. So if we can focus more on attenuating the risk before it becomes the end stage of disease, that's probably the most beneficial from a global health perspective and individual patient outcome uh, perspective. Robert? Well, the um, data on the uh, inflammation in the brain is uh, fascinating. And clearly, chronic inflammation is associated with cognitive uh, decline. We're taking the opportunity in our, uh, our uh, you know, federally funded uh, study to look at uh, HDL uh, proteome as a uh, modulator of inflammation and incident Alzheimer's disease in the uh, REGARD study. And what we're going to be able to bring to the table is uh, the association with SNPs, the HDL SNPs and the inflammatory SNPs, to get at this at a genetic uh, level. But clearly, chronic inflammation is uh, a very important uh, you know, factor uh, here. And um, this is uh, great work that will uh, serve uh, as a wonderful citation for our, uh, all of our future work in our, our uh, project. Uh, Dr. Fuster, this data. Uh, these data are going to set a different paradigm altogether. The reason being that uh, uh, the inflammation does not occur in the cerebral arteries normally. They are more fibrotic plaques, yeah. uh, as we know. So this is going way beyond inflammation. I think, I mean, this, this has a far-reaching impact. Um, I don't know whether it is the, the fluidity of the artery that you always talk of or the motility of the arteries that you have been uh, discussing about and the way the uh, proteins are lost but are not taken up uh, uh, in, in the deposition and all, whether they are, they are involved in it or what else is happening, I do not know. But this, I think, goes even beyond inflammation. Yeah, well, I think it's the new technology of imaging is amazing, Gina. What we can do that you know a few years ago was impossible. Now you can have an idea, and you know what the new technology to be used and so forth. Yeah, Peter. I think this is a great opportunity because now you have a tool to begin to evaluate intervention strategies. You know, which has been so challenging in this population. Yeah, this is a, a game changer. Yeah. I think if you have going back to cardiac and not so much vascular, but if you have a cardiac MRI. Um, from your publication in 2008, and you're able to do all this parametric uh, mapping and actually have measurements, T1, T2 measurements, 
and then co-localization with an MR, a uh, pet MR, um, I think on a, on a cellular level, if we could get that, that um, specific with pet, cardiac pet MR, I think you'll see a lot of correlation with, um, with so uh, MR of the head, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Questions? We have five minutes. Yes. Could you, could you comment on the reduce it trial? Because it was very good, and yet, why did it work? It had very little effect on triglycerides. Well, Robert yeah, okay, or I Peter? Start, yeah, yeah, me. I, Peter I and Robert. Yeah, yeah. So I don't uh, pretend to know all the answers, uh, but uh, it also is uh, uh, the, uh, and I think it was in the list there. You know, it's a population that had a residual risk, and uh, you know, so this was a definitely elevation of triglyceride was actually a component of that. And uh, the other aspect is that uh, you know when you use uh, the uh, agent, you know, it does actually have. Uh, anti-inflammatory, you know, so it had anti-platelet, you know, it's really actually a very interesting, it's a drug really, you know, we think of it as kind of a component official, but it's really actually a purified uh, agent, uh, uh, you know, like Cosepandol, so that uh, had actually a, a, almost a pharmacological effect. It did actually lower the triglyceride, yeah, but it did not, uh, you know, so uh, just the fact that uh, you got exposure to it, you know, you got a benefit, and you also see that, uh, you know, it uh, diverges the, uh, you know, sort of uh, after exposure quite consistently, suggesting it's fundamentally addressing many of these mechanisms. So it's probably not a, just a pure triglyceride agent, uh, but in fact, it impacted many of these uh, components favorably. I have a last slide actually for Roxana and you, Robert, which is fascinating. This is what has happened with mortality following myocardial infarction and as the drugs have evolved. I think uh, I'm just, trying to, this is STEMI, this is non-STEMI, and this is, you know, 1996-2004. And what is really fascinating to me is how much we continue to learn on issues that appear we already learn everything. And inflammation today is a new one that we cannot hear. In the residual uh, situation that we talk about today, it should be added here. It might be possible that this will go down. I'm talking about chronic disease or, or myocardial infarction, but I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I still remember when, when, when we did the trial on cabbage and aspirin, we were so excited because it was nothing else. And you could drop the graft occlusion from 17% to 4%. Today, perhaps we don't achieve that because all these drugs are already doing their work, and perhaps the work is more... Is more um, uh, frustrating, uh, like the trial that you mentioned that didn't work, you know, you have so many mechanisms that are now being approached to have a drug that really makes a difference is much more difficult anyway. But I just wanted to see what your comments are, Roxanne, and you, Michael. You are the new generation of physicians, and what you are seeing is a lot has been done already. And uh, but Roxana is, is a little bit... Uh... I think what we're seeing is a very, very um, daunting, flat mortality curve for STEMI patients in the last decade, where we've made a lot of, you know, in blue is STEMI, and this was published also in the New England Journal, where we've made a lot of progress in going fast to the cath lab, doing everything we possibly can. But you see the mortality curves are actually flat. Yeah. So there's no real further reduction. So we better start, instead of stacking therapies and looking at this thrombotic pathway, to look at these alternative pathways, which is, I think, what you're trying to tell us. But I think more importantly also is this pushing the LDL down really into the basement and now moving towards the inflammatory pathways, and then even maybe on the thrombin inhibition with, uh, with the COMPASS data that's coming out. But what we don't know is the prevalence of STEMI and non-STEMI. Yeah. Has that re yeah, been reduced? And I think mm -hmm. that, that you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, we don't have to wake up in the middle of the night jumping in as much as we used to for STEMI patients. And so there must be some impact from all of the work that's been done. But the fact that the mortality is flat, we've got to do other things. Well, you know, we have maybe Ticargal or Impasugal are not doing what they are supposed, you know, because there are already all these roots here, right. you know. Michael? Yeah, I think um, it's an exciting time to be a cardiology fellow. Uh, as you always say, you know, with regards to stents and, and STEMIs and 
preventing the stent thrombosis. We focus a lot on antiplatelet regimens and single antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet, anticoagulation, but maybe we should focus on other pathways as opposed to titrating the same pathways we've been doing over and over again. Um, not to poo-poo that, but the point being that there's still a lot of residual risk, uh, and rather than focusing on relative risk reduction, we should look more closely at absolute risk reduction, uh, which needs to be done probably with alternative pathways. Yeah, it's a good comment. Yes, Gina. One question for Dr. Liu, if you don't mind. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, in this Jack paper, I just go back to it because I thought it was pretty fascinating. We basically have four immunomodulators in cardiovascular disease. It goes back to basics, aspirin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor and a statin. Um, why have our immunomodulator um, studies, and there's quite a few out there, um, why have they failed when oncology is surpassing us and able to treat an inflammatory response, a cancerous response, an over-inflammatory response with immunomodulated therapy? I mean, I know it's not that simple of a question, but um, I just wanted your input. Yeah, so, and uh, some of this, you know, actually was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, so I would say that cancer always had the advantage because they got the tissue, they can actually directly look at it. You know, we don't have that uh, luxury uh, in cardiovascular. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, and some of this is that uh, when we uh, use single agents uh, in a complex system that has a delicate balance, sometimes there are unintended consequences and come back back up. Uh, you know, sort of bite us. And uh, this is where, you know, for example, you have data on consistency, like, uh, you know, data from a Mendelian randomization to show that this is actually appropriate target. And that uh, when you actually have this type of uh, uh, approach that it doesn't, uh, you know, it actually uh, changes all the major pathways in the right direction rather than actually having, uh, you know, sort of a counter-regulated system that's coming up back up. Uh, but I want to actually mention uh, if, as a sidebar, you know, a little bit of my favorite area is that's a potential is that's vaccine. And uh, so, you know, so there is actually data, you know, to suggest certainly just uh, accidentally when you actually have a flu, you tend to actually, you know, have more complications in terms of myocardial infarction. And uh, there's a big trial right now going on to see, you know, if you actually give flu vaccine, uh, which really just changes kind of the inflammatory potential. So we actually been working, you know, just playing around with developing different type of uh, atherosclerotic vaccines, sometimes, you know, based on uh, the atherosclerotic plaque itself or in terms of vascular smooth muscle. And it's very interesting that just the vaccine process itself actually uh, changes, uh, you know, the, the fact that there is a vaccine there uh, changes the M1, M2 balance and also upregulated T uh, regulatory cells and also promote, you know, L2, which is kind of a protective, uh, you know, component. So there is a possibility, you know, of course, this is still a long journey. Uh, you know, about the public health issue, which you raised right at the beginning, that uh, one could begin to think of down the road uh, in which to address on the public health side uh, that, uh, you know, if we actually develop an atherosclerotic vaccine, which is really designed not necessarily to car target that hot plaque, but actually to lower the appropriate inflammatory potential in the at-risk uh, individual, you know, could it be, you know, a much more accessible public health approach. And uh, then, you know, together with PCSK9, SRNA, you know, in which is one shot, you know, for many years, you know, so you just get, you know, sort of one shot, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, your uh, a pediatric, uh, you know, injection to prevent uh, infectious disease. Well, I think you you're, <laughs> I hope your uh, wishful hope is more than a wishful thinking here. Uh, I, uh, you know, I can be wrong so many times, but you know these systems are so complex that to find a vaccine that is going to knock out a heterogeneous disease like this is just difficult intuitively to get. Anyway, but this is a point of view. Well, anyway, thank you very much to everybody. The thank you. Last, uh, last 20 seconds of your podcast, I think that is what uh, Peter should be listening to, that I'm not closing the doors on the vaccine, yeah. but... <laughs> Okay. I doubt that it is going sure. to work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>